Welcome back to another episode of the All Things Interesting podcast, where I talk with guests from a wide variety of backgrounds to share with you their unique stories and to explore incredibly interesting topics. On this episode, I am joined by Eduardo Longoria, co-founder of the biomanufacturing company Portunas. Eduardo joins the show to talk about all things biomanufacturing, including not only its potential to change the world, but how it's a sustainable alternative to the way we currently produce things such as pharmaceuticals and foods. We also take a look at industrial policy and the startup world in Latin America. It's an interesting conversation in an area of manufacturing that isn't talked about enough. For those who enjoyed this episode or the show, please feel free to subscribe to the All Things Interesting podcast on your favorite platform and drop a comment. So, without further ado, enjoy the show with my guest, Eduardo Longoria. Just kicking things off here, Eduardo. First off, welcome to the show. Really glad to have you here. Roshan Terrell, one of my prior guests, recommended you as a future guest on the show. And a lot of individuals he's worked with in the past or knows work in very fascinating fields themselves. Uh, You nonetheless working in the field of biomanufacturing. So again, welcome to the show awesome to have you here great to be here and uh, thank you very much Rashawn. Uh, he's a very bright guy and i really appreciate the recommendation so biotechnology i will admit going into this conversation that this is a field that truly stumped me because i believe it's more so a recent field than not and from what i've gathered based on my research there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of information relative to this field. So I thought it would be best if we started with the very basics of what biomanufacturing is. So I'll start off with my first question here, which is, for starters, how would you describe the term biomanufacturing to someone? Uh, Well, in most basic terms, it's just using organisms to go from inputs, say sugar or cellulose or uh, perhaps lactic acid, and producing something more valuable through the process done by that organism so that on the other end you have something more valuable to you. Uh, The thing is, we think biotechnology, we're thinking cloning, we're thinking... You know, something out of uh, Westworld or something out of a (laughs) sci-fi show. But biotechnology is actually a lot older than we give it credit for. I mean, some of our first examples of biomanufacturing were making beer or making cheese. I mean, yeah, it sounds a bit, you know, mundane, but really that is biomanufacturing. You're using yeast, beer yeast, S. cerevisiae, to go from sugar and water to a beverage and you know in mm-hmm. ancient times the water wasn't necessarily potable and so because of that biotechnology making beer civilization could exist now that i have that definition in my head the first thing that really comes to mind because you brought up the word yeast so would the baking of bread which utilizes yeast would that be considered biomanufacturing i mean yeah If you really want to go to broadest, simplest definitions, yeah, that's biomanufacturing. Okay, wow. So I guess it's something that people use on a daily basis throughout their lives, but it's not a term that's, I guess, widely used. Yeah, exactly. It's it's one of those things that is so common and so pervasive we don't notice it anymore. And the term is really only used when it's to the very impressive things. We use the term biomanufacturing like when we're making medications, 
but it does still mm-hmm. apply for the super simple stuff. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like some of the applications I could see relevant or related to biomanufacturing would be using algae to clean oil spills. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, or even the creation of alternative foods such as Beyond Meat, where they just synthesize um, a lot of biomaterials or organic materials into a substance that is almost like uh, a hamburger, for example. Yes, uh, bioprinting actually, you know, the production of cells in an organized format using biotechnology. That is a good example of, you know, trying to produce meat just from the cells. Uh, I'm not that familiar with Beyond Meat. I believe it's a vegan alternative. So I assume it would be some sort of biomanufacturing, maybe out of fungi. Uh, But Mm -hmm. again, I'm not very familiar with their business model. Um... Yeah, I'm sorry. Am I answering your question? I may have gone yeah, off track. Yeah, I would say you are. I was just I was relating the definition you provided of biomanufacturing to, I guess, some of the applications that I see around the news these days in the technology area of algae being used to clean oil spills or meat substitutes being created, things like that, which we see naturally. Um, in the news, but we don't necessarily associate with the term biomanufacturing. We just see them for what they are. Yes, and all of that would also apply by the manufacturing of the product that would be used to get rid of the oil spill would be the actual biomanufacturing part. The part where the Mm. algae itself is decomposing the oil, that isn't within the purview of biomanufacturing. That is the thing's been manufactured. It is doing its job now. But the part, mm-hmm. the process of taking that algae and genetically altering it and growing it in large quantities in a bioreactor, monitoring the quality of it, monitoring how many cells survive, you know, through the process of being genetically altered, all of that is biomanufacturing. The, the preparation work that gets you to clean up the oil spill. So what would be the opposite of biomanufacturing? So you have just using the example here of using algae to clean oil spills. You were talking about uh, modifying the algae and testing it to see if it survives and if it cleans up the oil spills. But that aside, what would be a different method for cleaning oil spills that isn't biomanufacturing, just so people kind of have that perspective. Uh, Well, so some traditional ways to clean up oil spills, uh, you could use mechanical methods. So that's just using a skimmer and cleaning it off the top of the water. Um, You could, you know, use a shovel if it's on the ground and actually just scoop the earth up. Um, If you're not using any sort of biotechnology method to go after the oil spill, but you still want to go after it on a chemical level, you would likely have to synthesize a kind of chemical that would act as an emulsifier for the oil and make it so that it could dissolve into water and perhaps be washed away into a container somewhere. Uh, But the issue is there, you have to synthesize that chemical and because nothing living is synthesizing it, there's only a limited amount of activity that you can do. I was going to say, would uh, the creation of plastics or oil itself be an example of that since it's synthetic? Uh, yes, that actually would be an example. You know, it's traditional chemical synthesis. You pull your crude oil out of the earth. You have uh, your distillery. You separate out the different alkanes. And yeah, that, that would be very traditional, you know, separating out of chemicals. Huh. So... That said, what would kind of be the advantages of using biomaterials to manufacture these processes as opposed to traditional methods? I think that's kind of what people naturally are inclined to look at when they hear about this term. Like, well, what's the advantage of biomanufacturing these products to do this work for us? Well, first off, starting as far as the list of advantages of going for biomanufacturing versus traditional chemical synthesis... Uh, one, once you make the alteration to the cells, you know, whether it's, you know, mammal cells, fungal cells, bacterial, etc., you know, you, ha- you have a miniature factory that produces that particular chemical. And all you have to do is feed that organism and it will continue to produce for you. 
<laughs> Whereas in the case of chemical synthesis, you have to monitor it the whole time. You are quite literally taking chemical A, you know, heating it, maybe to decompose it, exposing it to an environment of methane, perhaps, uh, synthesizing another chemical, mixing it together. It's, it makes the process much more complex and much more involved. Whereas in the case of biomanufacturing, because you say have a yeast cell or many trillions of yeast cells all doing the job on their own, just as long as you provide enough oxygen, enough CO2, enough nutrients, and keep them at the right temperature range, it, you're able to make your production process not only a lot more independent, you know, because it is able to, as an organism, exist on its own, but also you're making it a lot more modular because it's the same model of you keep yeast alive and you feed them and they make a particular chemical that you want. So rather than, say, if you are synthesizing something out of oil, you need a gigantic distillery column to separate out you know, the different sizes of alkanes and getting your kerosene, mm -hmm. your pitch, your bitumen, all of that. Instead of doing all that and needing different equipment for each step, it's the same technology that you would be using in a brewery. You know, you're just using different yeast with different genetic modifications. But instead of beer, you might be able to get penicillin out of that. That is really interesting that you kind of provide the explanation in that sort of way. Because the first thing that really comes to mind is a couple of weeks ago, my brother was FaceTiming me and showing me a video of his garden that he built at home. And he had this giant greenhouse that he, not giant, but it was a moderately sized greenhouse. And there was a soil structure as the base. And in that soil, he included earthworms mm -hmm. and naturally earthworms are added to the soil to process kind of organic material. Uh, they recycle the contents into nutrients and they, essentially improve the soil structure and create tunnels uh, for air, water, and plant roots. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, when I'm hearing you explain this, I'm thinking to myself, well, this is a naturally occurring process when you add the earthworms into that soil. And it's in a way self-sustaining as long as you continue to add those living organisms to that system because it's producing fruits and vegetables as an output from that process. So in your mind, is that kind of a natural form of biotechnology? I would say, yeah, that, that is a natural form of biotechnology. It's also self-sustainable. Not necessarily all biotechnology is self-sustainable. However, the naturally occurring biotechnology, like you know, that example, like permaculture in general, is self-sustaining. Uh, but, but yes, I do think gardening could be a good example of that when well-designed, when you, know, you do have your, uh, your, your sapotrophs, you do have uh, enough lighting, you have good water drainage. You know, yeah, that is self-sustaining biotech. Just to pause for one moment, you mentioned a word, sapotrophs. I apologize because myself, and I'm, I'm sure that many of my listeners out there uh, probably haven't heard of that term. So can you kind of uh, provide a, a little context to what that means? Uh, yeah. Uh, so sorry about that. Sapotrophy, it's the idea of uh, the, your decomposers. Uh, they get their nutrients from things that have died as part of the, the food web. Uh, so sapotrophs, some examples, your fungi worms, uh, some kinds of insects, certain kinds of plants could be sapotrophic. Uh, they're, they're the recycling men of the food web. Um, you know, when something dies, they get their energy from the decomp from, from the, the corpse. They are the decomposers that get mm. their, their energy, you know, from that trophic level. Like an autotroph uh, self energy. That's, you know, your plants, they photosynthesize heterotroph other energy so that's us we get our energy from eating other things uh, sapotrophs mm -hmm. get you know, their energy from things that die and decompose and restart you know the food web the cycle of energy keeping everything going so what kind of really stands out here 
about what you're saying is you bring up the idea of recycling. And when we look at kind of the advantages of biomanufacturing as opposed to synthetic manufacturing, in, in my head I'm thinking, well, the advantages are clear cut in the sense that you are recycling a naturally occurring process as opposed to synthetically creating something which is in a way reducing a limited amount of resources that we have available is that kind of a true like a a valid explanation of one of the clear-cut advantages of bio manufacturing in this case i would say it, it is as long as that particular process incorporates that biomanufacturing does not necessarily have to incorporate that sort of recycling sustainable you know type of approach however it naturally lends itself to it uh, so i just want to be very clear yes biomanufacturing can do that but just because something is biomanufacturing does not mean it does mm. it just makes it very okay. easy to do uh, Yes, in most cases it can. For instance, like you know what we do at Portunus, that is an example. We're taking shrimp shells that are being thrown out because people generally don't eat the shrimp shells, and then turn that <laughs> into a product. Huh. And we'll be we're going to get to Portunus a little later in this conversation. Um, but before we do that, just sticking real quick yes, with course. the very basics <laughs> of biomanufacturing here, I want to play devil's advocate for a moment yeah go ahead what would you say is the biggest drawback or challenge of biomanufacturing and what are some ways or what is being done to overcome this drawback well as far as immediate disadvantages that i have encountered in my experience i'd say the smell certainly um growing the smell yes uh, growing (laughs) large numbers of yeast cells uh it does have a particular smell to it that's not the best um in in all honesty having a, a hepa filter and having a well ventilated lab uh, having you know, materials to keep the air clean that uh, that usually takes care of it it's mostly just you know kind of a gross smell but it's tolerable after a while um all it, the, <laughs> yes i am not necessarily the 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 far-reaching answer you're going for i'm trying to come up with something a little better <laughs> i have to ask is is the smell something that is typically associated with all biomanufacturing processes or is it only occurring with like certain manufacturing processes like i guess like the one example you mentioned was with the usage of shrimp shells uh so that particular smell depending upon what kind of cells you're using and what you're producing it does have a different smell however considering a lot of biomanufacturing does use yeast cells uh yeast cells do have their own particular smell which is the one that i'm talking about right now However, our particular process using bacteria to decompose shrimp shells, that does have its own smell, which my partner describes as punching you in the guts. Uh, it is <laughs> it is pungent, and yes, that has its own particular brand of stink. But what's, the, what's kind of the process of breaking down shrimp shells, just so we can have kind of a context of like what goes on? and the day of a life of a biomanufacturer in this uh, specific instance. So in this specific instance, we're uh, going from the de- uh, the, uh, the tossed out shrimp shells, you know, the kind of thing you might leave on your plate at the end of a you know seafood meal, you know, your headless shrimp shells. Uh, we grind those down uh, the most that we can using an industrial sized grinder. Turns out into kind of a, you know, pinkish gray shrimp paste. This pinkish gray shrimp paste is then mixed with salt water and uh, inoculated with our mixture of bacteria, uh, the kind of bacteria that you might find in the stomach of a catfish, maybe in a, some particular bottom feeding organism that you know primarily eats crab and shrimp and other crustaceans. Uh, we inoculate with this bacteria and we put an air pump into the bioreactor and wait six weeks for the decomposition to reach its final stages and then you know we'll go about our process of extracting the chitosan from the mix drying it cleaning it 
make she making sure that it doesn't have any uh, antigens on it, um, etc. Um, uh, uh, how uh, how does one come up with processes like these? Because this sounds extremely complex. So does it kind of require a lot of, I guess, scientific methodology of hypothesizing what would be required to extract certain material and then testing it and then reformulating until you kind of get to a process that outputs what you're expecting? Or is bio, in biomanufacturing, is the process completely different to go from uh, biomaterial to extracted material, which you're doing with the, the shells in this case? Well, you're giving me a lot of credit here, Tasher. Uh, <laughs> to be fair, um, actually, the process wasn't really as complex as, as you might think, because this is based off of the digestive system of an animal. I mean, catfish do eat crustaceans off the bottom of the ocean or the, the bottom of the river, whichever, uh, quite regularly. And that same, that same bacterial mixture in their stomach and intestines produces enzymes, chitinases, that break down chitin into chitosan. So really all we have to do is produce the same environment that one might see in the digestive system of a catfish and just follow that same model. Uh, so, you know, being able to follow that same model, well, we know that, you know, certain organisms live in salt water, certain organisms live in fresh water. I chose salt water on account of the fact that the salt helps ensure that the bioreactor doesn't get infected because, you mm -hmm. know, the organisms that can live in not salty environments tend to not do very well in particularly salty environments. So I, you know, combine those bacteria. Um, perhaps I'm getting a bit away from the crux of the question uh <laughs> no that's uh, that's completely fine i do have to ask though are it's 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 interesting because it sounds like a lot of these manufacturing processes and biomanufacturing are pulled based off real naturally occurring processes i know you mentioned that the fish eats uh the shrimp or crustaceans and you're basing your process off how it digests that shrimp or crustacean, for example. Oh, yes. So is that really is that really what occurs for most biomanufacturing companies? They just look at what's naturally occurring and then try to mimic that? I would say not most. I would say that, um, well, first of all, there's a whole field on that called biomimetics, uh, mimicry of biology. Uh, you know, um, what I would say our process is, it is biomimetic. We did look at nature, mimic it, and take inspiration from what it does. Uh, in most cases of biomanufacturing, I wouldn't necessarily call it biomimetic. Does, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, you are harnessing yeast cells in nature for your own particular ends. However, I would not say it is biomimetic because the end goal and the process do not itself imitate something already existing in nature. Uh, was that... Hmm. It answers the question. I'm... Would you prefer something a hmm. bit different? Yeah, you can elaborate on that. I think that would be helpful. Okay, yes. <laughs> uh, so, biomimetics, it is the science of mimicking, of imitating, of taking inspiration from biology, from nature around you, and using that in your engineering process. Uh, so, like, say there's, you know, gloves that have the same structure as the pads of a gecko, uh, that hmm. it has crazy amounts of surface area. And this amount of surface area, you know, harnesses the van der Waals forces between molecules and allows you to stick to a wall in the same way a gecko would. That would be an example of bio, uh, biomimetics being used in material science. Uh, our process of Bortunus would be an example of biomimetics used in biomanufacturing. However, in most cases of biomanufacturing, it is not necessarily a biomimetic process because the inspiration that led to that particular process did not itself come from nature. Yes, the yeast cells themselves are naturally occurring, and yes, the process may have a natural origin, but it mm -hmm. is not intellectually taken from, it is not intellectually inspired by 
a particular natural process, if you get what I'm saying. I, yeah, I, I understand. I, I'm I'm thinking in my head right now, though, is there an advantage, advantage to coming up with a synthetic form in biomanufacturing as opposed to taking complete inspiration from a naturally occurring process? Because at least I would think that something that naturally occurs in nature would be a process that has been around for potentially thousands of years. And if it already works well that way, why would you have to go through all of the work to come up with something else? Why not just take inspiration from something that already exists? Oh, yes. It, it's a massive advantage to take inspiration from nature. No, it's a, of course. If it's already existing, why reinvent the wheel? And, <laughs> and what I would say is that it, it's not a question of whether or not it's an advantage. It's definitely an advantage to take inspiration from nature and go with a biomimetic approach i think it's just that industry has its own culture already existing a lot of the major biomanufacturing you see takes place in pharmaceutical companies pharmaceutical companies that have been around for in some cases over a century uh changing mm -hmm. of corporate culture does take quite a bit of of effort and it, there's a lot of inertia involved in it uh, yes companies like bayer are doing you know biomimetically inspired processes but it's not pervasive as i would say it is in smaller more startup -y type companies but i would think that's mostly just because of corporate inertia as well as that there is uh, already a lot of products that use the chemical synthesis method and when you are someone like Pfizer or Bayer, uh, the board doesn't necessarily care that much. But again, I, I don't sit on the board of either Pfizer or Bayer, so I can't <laughs> pretend to be an authority on that. Right. One of the examples you just brought up, and I just I like providing context to my guests here in terms of applications. But you you mentioned pharmaceuticals, and I guess one of the most well known pharmaceutical drugs is penicillin. Mm -hmm. And I believe that comes from the processing of, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, I believe it's mold. Uh -huh. uh, wouldn't wouldn't that be a, a popular example of biomanufacturing in this case? Uh, yeah, that, that actually would be a popular example of biomanufacturing. Uh, Ian Fleming, I believe, ended up finding one of his uh, agar plates covered in mold at one point because he went on vacation. And the bacterial colonies that were on that uh, particular agar plate ended up dying off uh, the closer they were to this particular uh, mold that had gotten on the plate. And noticed that, well, well, the closer these colonies are to the plate, the more likely they were to die. Let me take a sample of this particular mold and you know, see why does it keep doing what it's doing. And then he did isolate penicillin from that particular mold. That is awesome. It's It sounds like a lot of inventions in history come about sort of by mistake or just by random randomized testing of things. It's not as though people are focused solely on the invention of one thing, but when they, when they are, sometimes their research leads them to the discovery of other solutions or other innovative uh, ideas that they weren't naturally or inherently focused on beginning. And I, I don't have any examples uh, in front of me right now, but I just think that's probably one of the coolest things about science in of itself. Oh yeah, of course. Everything builds on it, on, a, on each other. I mean, I, I guess uh, universities, when they first became a thing, you know, you're getting together a lot of, you know, literate, uh, you know, literate well-educated people wanting to become better educated and so they exchange information and everyone becomes smarter as a result i mean <laughs> i'd argue the internet is that same concept you are gathering together ideas from people everywhere and depending upon how much of its cat videos uh you know you might end up getting information you never could have before and as a result you know one good idea begets another and we all build on each other and that's the value of cooperation Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we live in incredible times, especially with the access to the technology we have, the internet, it provides so much valuable information. And on top of that, the ability to collaborate with people all over the world. 
uh, especially in the field you're working in. So I think it's absolutely incredible. Um, one thing we didn't touch on though, and I apologize for this, I've been meaning to ask, uh, I'd never asked about you or exactly what was it about the field that really motivated you or drove you to be into biomanufacturing? Was there a specific point in time that made you decide this is what I want to be doing? Uh, well, I was a big fan of biology in high school. Um, though specifically for biomanufacturing, uh, okay. So I had always really liked the second world war and that there was a kind of an interesting quote that I, I believe was either a Stalin quote or a quote from mm -hmm. Zhukov, uh, Field Mar Marshal Georgi Zhukov, the one who uh, uh, was able to uh, uh, finally put the Soviet flag in uh, in Berlin. Uh, the first Allied mm -hmm. general that ended up making it to Germany right. and winning the war. Uh, point B. Uh, the the quote quality uh, sorry quantity has a quality all its own. Um, okay, yeah, that sounds weird and doesn't really have a lot to do with biomanufacturing, but trust me, give me, <laughs> give me like a couple minutes here. Um, so, uh, the Soviet army ended up overwhelming one of the most technologically advanced militaries on the planet by sheer numbers and being able to produce their particular units at a lower cost more efficiently than the Germans could. So there's actually an interesting documentary on tank manufacturing in the Second World War. Uh, so it discussed how Albert Kahn, an architect from Detroit, one of the guys responsible for building the factories of Ford, GM, uh, you know, the, the titans of industry in America at the time, actually was hired as a consultant by the USSR to develop their tank factories during the Second World War. Because uh, when the Germans invaded Soviet territory, because Blitzkrieg was as it was, German lightning war, they're moving at such a pace, the Soviets actually had to move their factories, their whole industrial capacity, into the Russian East, so that it'd be safe from you know, German bombs. Uh, and Albert Kahn was part of this whole process and actually was one of the individuals that came up with planned obsolescence. And during the Second World War, uh, a lot of the fields of statistics that are used today to estimate product life, to estimate product efficacy, to be able to really optimize production came out of this. Uh, so in this case, they did an analysis on the Soviet T-34 tank that after it rolled off the assembly line, it had an average lifespan of six months. And so from that information, they decided, well, how well do we need to design the tolerances of the gearbox, of the turret, of all of these moving parts so that it'll last six months and no longer? So that they wouldn't devote more energy, more time, more you know, intellectual capacity of their engineers than they needed to to produce that particular product. Here's why that's relevant. This war was won by innovations like that. Because the USSR was kind of, you know, Stalin had purged the majority of his uh, of the elite of the Russian of the Soviet military at the time because he was a paranoid lunatic. Um, a lot of the organization of the USSR was pretty poorly put together again because everyone's terrified of Stalin and Stalin. <laughs> like he act, he imprisoned Georgi Zhukov at the end of the war because he was too popular. He did his job too well and went to prison. But my point is is that. The technological innovations that really make society better, that you see really making changes in the world, are actually from the eureka moments of maybe a decade ago finally becoming affordable, scalable, and accessible to the average person. I mean, for example, uh, uh, PCR finally became a thing in the 1970s, I believe. Uh, but it didn't really matter for much of anything 
until such a point that this technology became common, affordable, accessible, and scalable, you know, you weren't able to have uh, DNA testing for uh, at a murder scene. You know, being able to take a sample of blood and analyze, oh, well, who was this? Can we reproduce this DNA to such an extent, making billions and billions of copies, that now we are able to reap the benefits of ha being able to test who this person is and being able to find a, a, a murderer, potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, or like with 23andMe, you know, a PCR becoming so common and affordable that now you can get your entire genome tested and then the results mailed to you. You know, PCR has been around for many decades, but only now that it's become cheap and scalable that we can have all of the benefits that we have now. Just to pause for one moment, you mentioned the word PCR. Uh, for those listeners out there who don't know what it is, uh, can you kind of give a brief description of what it is? Uh, yes, yeah, so PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, it was originally a method to take uh, you know, just a few sections of DNA and reproduce it exponentially. So after a few hours, you have billions of copies of that same section of DNA. And you have sufficient genetic material to do tests on, like, uh, well, does this section of DNA match? A particular person we have on file oh this is this person's blood that we found or oh hey this is a neanderthal bone and <laughs> you know oh, isn't that interesting uh, you know it turns out they have a certain percentage similarity to uh, modern humans um it's pcr that allows you to have enough copies of that dna to do those experiments Ah, I see. So it's creating a large sample to use for testing purposes, right? Exactly. Uh, so it's you know, a series of heated water baths, or there are PCR machines today, but it was originally started off with hot water baths and enzymes. Uh, so you have a hot water bath to split the DNA uh, into its two sections, and then you have a uh, uh, an enzyme called TAC polymerase, or a uh, yeah, TAC polymerase, uh, that builds uh, new sections of DNA that are opposite the two strands you produced. So one strand turns into two double strands, and then you repeat that cycle, which turns into four, which turns into eight, which turns into 16. And you do this cycle over and over again until you eventually have billions of copies. And there you go. Huh. So we went from, in, the, in this story, we went from stalin all the way to innovation and kind of that eureka moment of the transition from things being somewhat used to them becoming more affordable and more scalable to the point where we could mass produce them so at the end of the day how would you say this really drove you or motivated you to kind of pursue this field behind that story so behind that story uh, being able to see on the one hand the incredible sci-fi era technology that is possible with biotech and all of the advances we made in biology but really developing that understanding from that you know story about the second world war about albert Kahn, about innovations that actually affect people's lives and that it does come from the eureka moments of 10 years ago becoming affordable, scalable, and so much so that they are normal. Mm -hmm. And really, if we want a kind of sci-fi, incredible world, that's where it's going to come from. The marriage of these multiple fields of, yes, we can do the research, yes, we can produce the prototype, and the technology is incredible, but it is simultaneously affordable and scalable enough that you or me or some guy down the street or someone in china for a fairly reasonable price can get it shipped to them in the course of you know, three days or so that's when you get a sci-fi world when the incredible becomes scalable to the point that it's normal i mean if you went back ten thousand years ago with a bottle of beer or a block of cheese they'd think you're a wizard like oh my god <laughs> it's something i can drink that doesn't make me sick and it tastes awesome and also i get a buzz but mm -hmm. no one's going to be like amazed that, like, okay, yeah, you went down to the convenience store and got a bottle of beer. Cool. Because it's so common and so easily produced now, it's normal and no one bats an eye. 
Right. One of the things that kind of stands out, though, is the idea about how things become more affordable and accessible so that it spurns innovation at a must a much faster rate so to speak so my question to that is do you think we're approaching a sort of period in time in which we're going to be able to have discoveries at an exponentially faster rate than we were decades ago because if you look at computers back in maybe the 40s 50s 60s they were massive machines and then if you look at it from the 90s to today around a 20 or so period we were able to miniaturize uh, cpus and computers down to the size of a a watch and it's just incredible to see how fast innovation occurs in such a short period of time now. So do you think that's something that's going to happen in your industry? Oh, of course. No, no, we already see it happening. The reason why biotechnology has gotten to the point that it has is because of computer processing power getting to the point that it has. So now as a result, uh, like getting your genome sequence, the Human Genome Project back in, I want to say, 1999, it was about a million dollars to sequence like 85% of one person's genome. Mm-hmm. Now that same cost, you know, about $100, <laughs> and it only took a few hours or so. No, we're already seeing that, and it's great. Uh, that being said, where that's going to go, and if there is a, a logical end point to that exponential growth, that might be a bit above my pay grade. But yes, I certainly see it continuing at least for the next decade or so. That is absolutely mind-boggling just to see how something can cost a million dollars 20 years ago and only cost a hundred dollars now to do. Right? Right? Wow. It it just goes to show like how fast science is is advancing in conjunction with uh, technology advancements. It's, it's, It's amazing to see and kind of just in my opinion goes to show that the discoveries that took a hundred years to occur might only take a year or less to occur when we have technology and artificial intelligence doing a lot of the data crunching for us in the future. Yes. So it's, oh, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> so on the topic of biomanufacturing. I know I've been wanting to get to this uh, specific topic during the conversation, and that is Portunus. And apologies if I am butchering the name here. uh, but you said it right, (laughs) Portunus. You started a biomanufacturing company that focuses on the production of Kitasan. Can you describe, first off, Portunus, and then also what Kitasan is, because I personally don't understand what it is, or personally have never heard of it. Okay, sure. Uh, so Portunus, we started off in 2017. Uh, I got the name, uh, I'm a fan of mythology, um, and I thought that uh, this particular character out of Greco-Roman mythology, it's a combination of Palaemon. Uh, the Greek son of Poseidon, who is also the guardian of sailors, and the Roman god, Portunus. After the Romans took over Magna Graecia, these two deities were conflated into a singular one. So Roman god of harbors, as a result of Palaemon, keys, doors. Uh, I thought the symbolism would be great. It's like, oh yeah, we're a biotech company, we're supposed to be on the cutting edge of technology, of creation, of innovation, etc. Oh, well, what's a good symbol of that? Doors and keys <laughs> unlocking things. And also the ocean, because our main product, Kytosan, is derived from the shells of crustaceans, and our biomanufacturing process comes from the stomach of fish, and it just it, it just felt right. Also, the domain was available, which that was also pretty crucial. That's always a plus. Yes. Uh, just to go back to briefly uh the mythology aspect about this because i'm really curious you said that portunus is the greek god of doors and keys i'm curious what does that mean to be a deity of 
a door or a key specifically, is that specific to your example of innovation or were, was there sort of a different meaning back then? Well, granted, I admit I don't know quite everything about Roman mythology, but what I would say is that being the god of keys and doors likely means, you know, god of opportunity. From what I understand, there was a minor festival, Portinalia, where they would toss keys into uh, some sort of ritual fire, I believe. Mm. Uh, I, I assume the symbology of that does have something to do with opportunity and that sort of connotation because again the latin word uh, porta door portus for a port they have the same roots they're both sort of entryways portals going Mm -hmm. from one place to another i would assume in my entirely non-expert opinion that it would have something to do with you know opportunity the the open door going out of a place to another, that uh, transition, change, moving forward, etc. Hmm, I like the name. It's, it's very suitable and fitting for what your company does uh, relative to manufacturing of Kitasan, or Kitasan. Uh, Kitasan. Kitasan. Oh, no, okay. uh, <laughs> I am butchering the name left and right right now. <laughs> it, it, it's all right. It's, it, it's not exactly a term people throw around all the time. It, it's understandable. So we were talking about how Kaidasan is is based on, I guess, crustaceans in this case. And earlier we were talking about how the process is that you are mimicking sort of how a fish would process those shells through digestion. So mm-hmm. just to kind of elaborate on that process, what it, what is the end goal or what is the output your team is trying to produce from okay, that? So uh, our team takes the chitin from the shrimp shells and mm-hmm. uses the bacteria that we have in the bioreactor to produce chitinases, the enzymes that break down chitin, and produce chitosan. So chitosan is different from chitin in that it has the acetyl groups, uh, the oxygen bound to a carbon and three hydrogens, removed from the polymer chains that would ordinarily make chitin. Chitin is the material that makes up the exoskeletons of shrimp, crabs, lobsters, as well as the cell walls of fungi. It's the second most common biopolymer on Earth, second only to cellulose. And we produce from that chitin, chitosan, which can be used as a biopesticide, which is what our primary product is. It's uh, meant to protect coffee crops from fungal infections, particularly coffee leaf rust. But it's also used as a dietary supplement. It can be used to make bandages. Uh, It's used for drug delivery. It can be used... um, What else? I believe it's also used in beer fining as well. Because it's a positively charged molecule and it attracts uh, negatively charged molecules to it and it sort of cleans out the beer as a result. Uh, It's a biopolymer that has a lot of different industrial uses, but in particular, we use it in agriculture. Two things. One, you mentioned agriculture and it's used as a biopesticide. So that's essentially just to protect crops like you mentioned, coffee. Uh, plantations or even I'm assuming corn in this case is that correct Uh, yes it could be used on corn as well Um, the primary market that we're going after is coffee on account of the fact that well we're in Brazil and uh, particularly in our region the south uh, we have a lot of coffee plantations here a lot of gourmet coffee plantations people who would benefit very strongly from being able to say yes we do use an organic method of pest control that yes, we are environmentally friendly, and no, none of these pesticides are toxic, and yes, we are able to justify you know the price of our coffee. Oh wow! And then the second thing is, is I found it interesting. You mentioned that it's a dietary supplement. Uh, yes, it has. I have seen it sold as a dietary supplement on Amazon. I admit I've never tried it, and I'm not a hundred percent sure on the efficacy of chitosan as a dietary supplement. 
though from what I have heard and the limited amount that I have read, it is, for whatever reason, able to glom on to fat molecules in the things that you eat and prevent them from being absorbed, from what I understand. But again, I have not read extensively into <laughs> the dietary use of Kaidasan. Huh, that's, that's very interesting, I'll have to say. One of the community questions I got about Kaidasan was, what was it about it that your company felt would be profitable? Well, for one, on account of the fact that we are able to produce Kaidasan with bacteria as opposed to using the chemical method, uh, mm -hmm. we're able to say that, yes, we are able to do this in a more environmentally friendly way, which I think you know gives us a certain edge in our marketing. Additionally, because Kaidasan is already a product that has been tested people do use it though to a relatively limited extent uh, there is already evidence of it having worked essentially what we're doing because we're using bacterial production the biomanufacturing rather than the chemical manufacturing we're able to save money and undercut the chemically produced competition uh, so that's another reason why we'd be able to make money third of all because kaidasan is used in so many different industries in the event of market corrections or perhaps uh, new regulations or whatever other unexpected monkey wrench might be thrown in, well, we'll be able to pivot if absolutely necessary. I don't think we'll need to. But if we do need to pivot from agriculture to wine manufacturing, we could do that. Or if we need to pivot into you know, making dietary supplements, while I would really, really, really prefer to do some research before <laughs> doing that, yes, we could. And I think that flexibility, because our product is used in so many different industries, and because our method of production is novel and thus you know, allows us to have lower costs because of what we've done, I think we are competitive in the market and are able to make money. And so overall, we have made some money so far, and I am optimistic for the future. Sounds like an incredibly well-rounded product with a lot of use cases, and I think the added benefit of being bio-friendly is something that a lot of companies are looking towards the future to do because everyone wants to get green everybody wants to avoid using synthetic chemicals um, on plants and things of that nature so i think it's a really interesting product that you're doing oh, um, thank you one thing i haven't asked so far though is how did this company of all companies come together? What was the major influence behind it? And is your team kind of comprised of scientists, business people, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, so team definitely comprised of scientists. Um, so I ended up meeting my team at uh, a course known as Exosphere that took place in 2017. Um, so when I was in college, I worked in a laboratory at the University of Texas at Austin. I uh, wasn't a huge fan of my job. It felt very, uh, well, the standard student work of, all right, go pour me some gels and stop talking. <laughs> and uh, you, you know where you are in the hierarchy and it's, it's low, it's low. I uh, wasn't a fan of that, so I left um, and ended up going to a lot of tech meetups. I ended up going to the Austin Biotech meetup. And met some guys who wanted to build their own laboratory. And I was super enthused about that idea, naturally. Uh, and we did. Uh, so formed a 501c3, uh, became Prophase Bio Studios. UT Austin had a surplus program that they gave away lab equipment to qualify in 501c3s. We did because our purpose is educational. Uh, so then we built a laboratory out of the local hacker space. And I got to tinker around a bit. Uh, one of the guys who was on the board of Prophase Bio Studios ended up having gone to this program, Exosphere, uh, you know, a couple years before, recommended I go. Uh, I gave it a shot. I met uh, you know, the, the biotech uh, section of that program, got in, and my professor and my lab partner for that particular course ended up becoming my business partners. Wow. So that's sci all scientists. 
One thing that really stood out was that you mentioned that you are a 501c3, which to my knowledge is a nonprofit organization. So is that kind of how your team went about acquiring all the necessary equipment or funding for your manufacturing? Because... I can imagine, and I could be wrong, but I can imagine that equipment for manufacturing, uh, especially in that space, would be incredibly expensive to acquire. So is that really kind of uh, a, a way to go about getting that equipment, just being a nonprofit, really? Oh, um, so to clear that up, uh, Prophase Bio Studios is a 501c3. Uh, that was the laboratory that I got my start in and did all of the original research in. Uh, however, Portunus is not a 501c3. We mm. are registered as a C Corp in Texas, and uh, we are also a for-profit company in Brazil as well. Uh, just to be very clear about that. Um, no, two separate entities. However, um, the amount of money saved by Prophase Biostudios, by me being a member there and doing the initial year and a half of R&D at that 501c3, helped immensely no no community bio biology labs biohacker spaces they do have a lot of benefits i'm very glad that i was able to be a member of prophase bio studios because it helped me so much because i could not have paid for all that equipment on my <laughs> that is that is very true uh, but no I... we're different entities Right. And I, I think that's typically one of the biggest questions uh, by people who start up companies, especially those that require a lot of overhead expenses. And it's kind of to the tune of, well, how do people typically just acquire the resources or funding to start up these ventures? Because one would imagine it's very complicated or difficult to get VC funding to build a business when you're starting from scratch. So it's very impressive how Portunus started out of, out of a lab and then built itself or scaled into a very impressive company that manufactures Kytosan or pulls Kytosan uh, for manufacturing purposes. I, I find that very interesting how you, your team was able to do that really. So, uh, First of all, with Prophase Bio Studios, that was a huge portion of the early development. Being able to do R&D out of that lab was immensely helpful and saved a crazy amount of money in the long term. Additionally, uh, a good part of our funding came from personal savings, which thankfully, because of the exchange rate, actually did favor us when we ended up moving to Brazil. So that's one thing that was helpful. Uh, third of all, uh, the environment in Brazil as regards funding, uh, there really aren't as, it's not as perhaps generous or perhaps active a VC environment uh, as you might have in the United States. A good deal of the funding resources, etc. for uh, innovation, particularly in biotechnology, is actually government-backed, especially oh, wow. the southern states. Paraná, Santa Catarina, and Rio Grande do Sul have very generous innovation programs that, you know, they have editals and you apply for them and you get grants as companies, as individuals, as nonprofits. Everyone can apply. And that is immensely helpful. Uh, just how enthusiastic the government is here about supporting innovation. Uh, so that's one thing. However, I will say there is an interesting project that has been helpful for Portunus as well, uh, out in the west of Paraná, about 700 kilometers west of us, uh, called the Biopark. So there is a company, Prazzi Donaduzzi. They are the largest all-Brazilian-owned biotech company in this country. They produce generic drugs for SUS, uh, the Universal Health System of Brazil. Uh, so they they multi-billion dollar company supplying the universal health system I, i'm sure you can imagine uh so their owner uh they're a family-run company interestingly enough uh their uh owner luis donaduzzi wanted to build an innovation park and so bought the area around his hometown a little town called toledo there used to be an italian colony bought the area and is building 
effectively trying to be biotech Silicon Valley. And that actually is, we are one of the companies incubated by them. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yes, the private sector does get involved just in somewhat rare occasions. And the way they get involved is slightly different. Um, They don't give money. They give resources. Uh, So for example, in our case, uh, we get an office in Toledo. Uh, They gave us what's called a bahacan. So it's effectively a, a large building that's lofted. So it effectively is like a mini factory. Um, Mm -hmm. They make all the renovations for us to be in compliance with Anvisa, uh, the Brazilian equivalent of the FDA. Uh, We get two years of electricity, water, all the bills covered, um, and they make connections for us, in this case, with uh, Shrimpers and the logistics uh, companies to get our raw materials to uh, our factory, our Baja Count. Mm -hmm. Um, So yes, while private sector investment does exist, it's less common, I think, than it is in the U.S., and it takes a different form. Uh, People are much more willing to give resources uh, than they are to give money in hand. Uh, That being said, still very, very thankful for it, and in some ways it does actually help more than the money, because it also saves us the legwork of finding people to provide us with shrimp shells. I think that's really cool uh, because being able to have those resources on hand and have uh, the materials available to you uh, really does help with a lot of the legwork. And I noticed that you have offices in the U.S. out of Texas and you have an office out of Brazil. And then you mentioned two different forms of funding. Uh, One would be VC funding and the other would be uh, the sort of funding that is provided by the government down in Brazil. Based on your experiences, what would you say has kind of been more beneficial or what would you say is more beneficial for a startup in this case to kind of have that funding that's provided in Brazil or the type of funding that you would typically see in the U.S. through VCs? Ooh. That's a tough question. Um, okay. In my particular case, I would say the resources kind of funding has been more helpful for the following reasons. I would say, first of all, because there are many different resources required, because it requires compliance with so many organizations on Visa for one, the local construction authorities for two, the local environmental authorities as well. Because, again, building a factory. Uh, The resources were incredibly helpful because, one, I I speak some Portuguese. And, yes, my partner is also a Brazilian native. But dealing with the bureaucracy in order to be in compliance can be a nightmare. And Mm. I would imagine if I were just handed the equivalent value of those services and told, okay, go find a lawyer go figure out how to do this, there might be some some more hiccups along the way and a lot of money burned on the way to getting the factory built rather than just having those resources available to me at the time. Uh, however, I would say maybe for companies that don't have quite so many legal hurdles or maybe don't have quite so much uh, of an upfront resource cost like needing to build a factory... Maybe the money in hand is more useful because they you know, have a bit, of, a bit less of a burn rate, mm-hmm. uh, a bit less of a cash burn rate, and more of their money can be spent on things directly related to their sales, their marketing, their paying of employees, etc. Uh, so I think that question, in my case, yes, the resource funding did very well, but that is particularly due to the kind of business I'm in. Typically, there's just a lot of red tape, so to speak, that could come with uh, the type of funding that comes through the government, I would assume. Yes, there is some red tape. Um, However, in that particular case, I was referring to the biopark and their their help. Um, That that kind of funding didn't come with so much red tape. However, government funding did... But I would also say because that is for more of our long-term projects, more than just the Kaidasan production, that it's doable. But but yes, certainly red tape and also because Brazil 
even more red tape. Uh, Brazil has a bit of a reputation for its red tape, and admittedly, it is a deserved one. Silicon Valley is typically brought up as the center place or the capital of innovation and startups, and you don't typically hear much about other places. Granted that there are, are other countries that are beginning to share some sort of sphere of influence with being tech startup capitals of the world. With Brazil, what kind of environment is it, would you say, in terms of startups? Do you see it sort of reaching a point where it could be deemed competitive with uh, places such as Silicon Valley nowadays? I would say at the moment, no. However, I think it is possible in the next 10 or 20 years to get to that point. However, there are certain provisos on that. Hmm. Uh, I would say firstly, uh, Brazil has massive intellectual capital. The federal university system, especially in the past decade or so before this current regime has uh, been power, uh, did very well spreading education. Uh, the Brazilian federal universities are considered to be the best in the country, and they are free if you can get in, and that's the crux of it. If you are qualified, <laughs> if you are genuinely bright, school is free. Mm -hmm. And so you are able to get people who otherwise would not be able to afford private school because naturally very expensive. You are able to get them educated once they've proven they are qualified for that. Uh, mm. The issue is is that because uh, of the particular economic environment of Brazil, uh, because also for a very long time, again, up until the current regime, uh, the uh, federal university system has been immensely generous, uh, very well funded, uh, professors with tenure, very well paid, everyone's happy at the federal university. You have some of the brightest minds of Brazil thinking, okay, yes... I would like to start a business, but damn, is my salary good? And also I have <laughs> damn good health insurance. Like, ah, okay, maybe next year. And then you think like, ah, maybe five years from now. Okay, you know what? This professorship is pretty good. I'll just stick here. And mm -hmm. you end up it's having It's sort of the golden issue. handcuffs. The golden handcuffs, yes. Uh, so I would say, yes, Brazil can do it. It's not a matter of not having enough uh, human resources. I think it's a matter of the human resources are somewhat occupied uh, well, by the golden handcuffs problem. Mm. Uh, additionally, I would say that once that particular issue is solved, and I think Brazil is in the process of adapting, making that transition towards... Uh, you know, people who are in academia being more willing to try entrepreneurial endeavors. I think places like the biopark help immensely. I think as that transition takes place, we will see more entrepreneurial Brazilians, more people trying to take that leap into the private sector. I think it just takes a bit of time, as well as organizations like the biopark getting rid of the golden handcuffs problem and also restoring faith of outside investors in brazil mm. uh I, there are concerns regarding uh, again the current regime and uh less faith from outside investors in investing in brazil uh for example the value of the hayal the brazilian currency when i first arrived here in 2019 it was approximately a one to three ratio with the dollar uh, oh wow yeah, that's pretty good considering, you know, the value of the currencies of their neighbors. Now it's hovering around five and a half to one. Is that sort of from the regime change or what kind of was the influence for that? Uh, a lot of that is due to the regime change, or at least from what I can tell. A lot of that is due to a loss of confidence in the institutions of Brazil uh, because the current regime has somewhat stacked those institutions with well, I don't want to say cronies, but uh, individuals to whom he has a somewhat close and non-professional relationship, uh, which does reduce the faith of outside investors in the potential of a country to actually act as a country and not 
a sort of cronyist organization. Uh, the point is, in order for a society to receive outside investment, which is crucial for developing something like a Silicon Valley environment, there has to be faith, not just in outside investors, but in consumers and people who would like to innovate and move their companies there. You know, faith on their on their half, on their part, that the government will honor its agreements, will be stable, will be uh, supporting innovation, that it will be a good place to work and live. But in cases of certain decisions that have been made, uh, cutting federal university funding, um, somewhat putting your foot in your mouth as regards uh, quite a laundry list of things. <laughs> it's somewhat harder to get that faith and confidence and investment that's needed to make a titan of industry. I think using the word might be a bit over the top, but corruption kind of comes to mind. And until that sort of corruption is removed and the environment in Brazil is made sort of viable for a more competitive landscape where entrepreneurship and innovation is more widely accepted as opposed to tenureship at a company and being paid large amounts of money and allowing people to move in with a lot of their startups. And once those startups are able to produce the revenues to be competitive against these institutions, I think at that point in time, you're really going to see the maturation and growth in that country for people to start becoming more invested in startups and becoming more in tune with the idea of becoming entrepreneurial as opposed to just taking a job at a company or an institution and just living there uh, for 40 years until you retire uh, granted, there are the golden handcuffs, which are beneficial, mind you, but I, I think it's creating that environment for growth, uh, which is what Brazil is really needing or looking for. I would agree with you on the majority of those points. However, I feel like <laughs> Brazil... No, this kind of gets into like the industrial policy bit that we were kind of touching on a little bit earlier. But... Uh, I feel like Brazil is somewhat unfairly stereotyped regarding the corruption issue. Mm. Is there corruption? Yes, clearly. However, what I would say is that there's a couple problems that go into that. Like um, Lava Jato, Operation Car Wash. Um, so the, the Petrobras scandal of uh, taking bribes and handing out government contracts to private entities... You know, that was one of, if not the largest corruption scandals of this century. Massive, yes, clearly a problem. However, what I would say is that it's not specifically a Brazil issue. And I think it's also due to the fact that the Brazilian definition of corruption is somewhat stricter than it is in many other places. Uh, for instance, we have lobbying in the United States. Um, lobbying, that's just corruption here. Um, th right. There is no way to put that. Uh, pork barrel spending as well. Uh, that's also illegal. Uh, putting you know extra funding into a bill as a means of making it more attractive to another senator, uh, in this case, deputado, but same concept. That is also illegal here. Uh, that's just blatantly corruption. Uh, so I would say because of those definitions of corruption, uh, it does end up being somewhat artificially inflated. Uh, that being said, that is on the macro scale. That sort of corruption, I think, is overinflated in the numbers that it's reported because of definitions. However, the corruption that we see on the low level with um, military police, uh, with the militias, especially in Rio de Janeiro, uh, with local officials, yes, that that is fair. There is a good deal of that. Um, and that, I do think, is a solvable problem, certainly. 
I think primarily because Brazil had for such a long time such a protectionist way to go about things. Um, for, For example, import tariffs. Import tariffs to this day can get as high as 60%. Which oh, is, wow. Yes. That's a it, lot. It, it, it elicits that reaction when I tell people. that That's kind of what I'm... Yeah, it, it's a lot. So imagine being a foreign company trying to compete in this environment. Either your product is radically cheaper or you don't compete. Um, so as a result of policies like that, that yes, originally were meant to have uh, you know import substitution you are able to foster local industry. To a certain extent, yes, they had a point. Other countries have done that successfully. The United States before 1945 had some of the highest tariffs on Earth. India, up until fairly recently, had very high tariffs, and they're kind of climbing out of the middle-income trap. They're doing relatively well. I think Brazil's issue in that regard, again, in my non-expert opinion, though I have done some reading, is that... It keeps those protectionist policies and does not have a time limit on them. And so as a result, you have your fledgling companies. They are able to be protected, but they have no incentive really to grow or improve if they know they will likely never have any competition. But say if you put a timeline on it, maybe only five years or so, then they would likely have competition later on and thus have incentive to improve and get better and be generally competitive for example there is a company positivo that produces computers here in paraná their main factory is i think like 20 kilometers away like brazil manufactures a lot of its own stuff and they're okay they're they're okay computers i would not be like oh i definitely want a positivo (laughs) computer but they work um the, the issue is they are comfortable enough to be mediocre. Mm-hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, if I have the opportunity, I'm going to get a different computer, and that's actually a major business. Up until, you know, fairly recently, it was common for a lot of Brazilians to go to Miami or other, you know, duty-free places in the U.S., buy like six laptops, come back and sell them for double the price, and people would still pay it because there is that difference because Positivo doesn't have to compete and there's no time limit on it Mm. Uh, so i'd say put a time limit on the protectionist policies and perhaps lower it a little bit and that might help develop innovation Uh, because certainly with the case of Positivo it's a bit of an issue so what i'm gathering from this is that By having these protectionist policies in place uh, within Brazil and having those 60% tariffs, the country itself is trying to be self-dependent and trying to rely internally on developing businesses. But by doing so, they're actually preventing innovation and growth because you're not able to import a lot of these products you're not able to have that competitive landscape that you would otherwise if people were able to import goods or resources into the country i'd say that's a major component of it yes Uh, brazil does very well as a middle income country the average the gdp i want to say is like 9800 something dollars it's not terrible Life for the average person is okay. But yes, I would say that as far as Brazilian institutions, Brazilian businesses competing on the global stage, Mm -hmm. it does definitely have some issues. Uh, I would like to see some of those changes, like a little bit more competition, a little bit less red tape, uh, a little bit lower taxes for, you know... uh, fledgling businesses i think that would overall be helpful for the development of brazilian institutions i think i would like to see companies like prachi donaduzzi compete outside of brazil they do sell Mm. some of their products to argentina to uruguay to the other mercosur countries 
Uh, but I would be shocked in every possible way if I saw any product from Bracci Donaduzzi end up in Europe or the United States or Canada. How does the competition or the startup landscape in Brazil compare to the rest of the region? Are other countries in that area also seeing somewhat of a growth when it comes to innovation? Or is Brazil considered to be the main proponent of that? Uh, Brazil, I wouldn't say it's the main proponent of it, but it's certainly chief, chief amongst the few. Um, so I would say on a per capita basis, Uruguay does better than us because Uruguay, I mean, it's, it's about the size of Rio Grande do Sul. It's a relatively small country, uh, per capita education very, very well. I believe they have a 98% literacy rate and the, yes, uh, they per capita beat us in the startup game. I would say Brazil right now is doing relatively well as far as startups go. Again, considering there's a pandemic, again, considering the regime, again, considering all of those factors, doing relatively well. Uh, I would say Argentina, well, it's having its own issues. It's having its own issues, but it's all right, I suppose. Um, I would say those three countries are really going to be your leaders in innovation on the continent for now. Um, unfortunately, Brazil's neighbors like Venezuela is having its substantial problems right now. Uh, Colombia is primarily affected by those issues. They have upwards of a million refugees there. Oh, wow. And, that's crazy. Uh, yes. Our third partner, Fabian Hernandez, actually lives in Bogota and has been keeping us abreast of uh, how things have changed, especially with Corona. Uh, they, they're, they're occupied. Um, so understandably, they're having some issues regarding the startup culture. Totally reasonable. Um, uh, Bolivia has always had its economic woes, and now is no different. So that's, again, understandable. I would say your major startup countries are going to be those three, uh, Chile, I believe at one point was doing fairly well in IT startups. I don't know how it's doing now, but it's possible Chile could be doing very well in the near future or maybe at the moment. Uh, but yes, uh, those three. Hmm. Latin America seems like it's experiencing a lot of growth then. I mean, granted, there is the pandemic right now, which you've mentioned a few times Um uh, in that response and i'm really curious actually because brazil itself is from what i'm gathering facing a huge pandemic with over two million confirmed cases of the virus and i think before this conversation you mentioned to me that your company is planning to have some form of manufacturing to support COVID-19 through protective gear. Um, is that something you're able to kind of talk about on this podcast? Uh, yeah, sure. I can talk about that. Um, so firstly, uh, yes, we are in the process of producing a prototype for a mask, a hydrogel mask made from a mixture of chitosan, the biopolymer, and polyaniline, uh, an electrically conductive polymer, making a hydrogel out of those two things, and producing a mask from it that will have uh, antibodies to uh, COVID-19 uh, embedded in the pores of the hydrogel. The idea in this case being that the antigens from the virus, say in the event of someone sneezing and it getting on your mask, uh, will interact with the antibodies in the mask, and that will end up having a chemical reaction uh, an amperometric chemical reaction, which will end up changing the amount of amps that the uh, conductive polymer, PANI, is able to conduct. And that will induce uh, the electronics that we would like to embed in this mask uh, to be able to log date, time, and location and send that information to your phone. The idea in this case being that we are able to make a wearable that is able to protect you from the virus as well as 
let you know when you have been exposed and log that information. So if you would like, you would be able to send that information to a particular organization, likely SUS or perhaps Anvisa in Brazil's case. So an epidemiological map could be made and these large-scale infections could be tracked and caught early. Uh, so the idea that that's the idea for the prototype, the mask that we are currently working on. Uh, our primary issue at the moment is actually the development of the hydrogel and making it both mechanically resilient enough to be able to be worn in a mask and not fall apart after a few weeks and being able to make it for under 20 hay ice because we don't think anyone's likely going to pay more than 20 hay ice for a mask. How much would 20 hay ice be in American dollars? Uh, four bucks, my son minus. That's not, that personally just sounds fairly affordable, though, $4 for a mask, because I'm pretty sure in the U.S. with the current pandemic, masks are pretty expensive, like around $10 or so per single one. That's, really? That's decent quality. I'm talking, oh, I, maybe wow. I'm going to look this up, actually. I'm curious. I could be wrong, but I wonder how much an N95 mask costs in the U.S. I could be completely wrong with this, oh, wow. but uh, let's see uh a 95 mask so i'm looking at it right now and for a five pack it's 15 dollars. so i i did get my numbers a bit wrong on there but i don't know how protective these masks are because you did mention that the purpose of the mask you're producing is to protect against the virus and it comes to it brings to question if you're de if you're developing a mask that prevents the virus from getting through it, how protective are the current masks that we see being sold by companies? Are they not defensible against COVID-19? Um, well, I would say the majority of masks, their purpose is not to protect you from the virus, but to protect other people from you if you have the virus. The idea being that, in all likelihood, that because you're spewing liquid out of your nose and mouth, that the mask is tightly woven enough to catch those droplets and prevent mm -hmm. them from moving out of the mask. However, the pore size is much too large to prevent an actual viral particle from leaving your mask. So say if you were to blow on someone through the mask yes the virus will get through because it will be carried on the air currents however if someone is sneezing and their their mucus and saliva is caught in the mask then that would be preventing the viral particles in the saliva and mucus from getting out of the mask <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned um sneezes because i'm this is there's one thing i recall learning in science i think it was either it might have been in high school but my professor was talking about how sneezes uh can travel up to a hundred miles per hour i believe and you're con you're taking into account thousands of droplets here so how is it possible that if you sneeze with a mask on that that doesn't get through the mask necessarily well i would say for one the surface tension of the fluid the mucus and saliva coming out of your mouth and nose uh, that surface tension helps the droplets stick to the uh, the inside of the mask to the actual weave of the mask uh, but yes i suppose some of the smaller droplets depending on how small they would be may end up breaking up on contact with the mask itself Mm -hmm. And perhaps smaller particles may be able to get out. That is also possible, I admit. It's not 100% protection. I'm certainly not saying that. <laughs> and I'm not a scientist by all means. I'm just making a guess based off what I'm, I learn or read about. No, no, that's, that's a reasonable <laughs> guess. Another thing that really stuck out about your explanation was its defense mechanism. And I'm curious to know, has this been tested thus far? Have you ran studies on the efficacy of the mask you're developing? No, no. We have yet to even make a prototype. It's very early stages. I think nonetheless, though, it's a, it's an incredibly interesting form of PPE. So 
if you're able to manufacture a product that I guess kills the virus on contact or at least prevents it from seeping through the mask that's that would be an incredibly helpful and beneficial uh, form of equipment to have for people and for individuals who are working in the medical field. So brill- it's a brilliant idea. If, if it works, that is. Yes, knocking on all of the wood for it to work. <laughs> exactly. It looks like we are coming up to time, Eduardo. But before we do end the show, uh, I always like to ask my guests five closing questions. So sure, go ahead. we're just going to go ahead and get started with them here. Given right. your experience... What is the most fascinating development in biomanufacturing that we should expect to see within the next 10 to 20 years? Well, I'd say at the moment, uh, bioprinting is still somewhat in its embryonic stages. I think the most fascinating thing we'll be seeing out of biomanufacturing will be bioprinting becoming scalable, affordable, and common. For the following reasons. If you're able to bioprint something at scale, you're effectively able to produce organs that are affordable. So no more transplant lists. So say someone with liver failure doesn't have to wait 16 months and roll the dice. They can actually get a new liver, their liver, printed for them and replaced. Uh, So effectively, that would be human beings now having interchangeable parts in the next 10 years. That, I think, would be incredible. Um, I would say, yeah, I think that would probably be the biggest thing that for sure is coming down the pipeline in the next 10 Mm -hmm. years. Um, I think something that could also be very interesting, but I'm not 100% sure of when this is coming or even if it's coming, But something I think would be very interesting would be the biomanufacturing of hard goods. Uh, There are certain kinds of bacteria that are able to uh, bioprint air quotes, but are able to uh, decompose, uh, digest minerals, and will actually release metals. Mm -hmm. And you can effectively use that for maybe mining if you wanted to be able to purify gold you know, from a liquid, maybe like a, you know, a geyser pool or an underground lake, you would be able to send bacteria into that geyser pool, have them consume whatever mineral, and poop out the gold, for lack of a better <laughs> term, coming from that. Uh, I mean, that's just kind of cool, not necessarily groundbreaking, but something I find kind of interesting, the idea of being able to harness biology for something a bit more unusual but yes definitely the bioprinting is the more important one there yeah that sounds absolutely incredible to me the use cases for that potentially right for someone that is interested in getting into the field of biomanufacturing what advice would you give to them well i would say studying microbiology probably is a good place to start Uh, It's probably a good way to see how much do you like biology in general. So before you get into the rest of it, do you like bio? Um, I would say a little bit of stats, not necessarily eat the whole stats book, but at least be familiar with it because that's going to be important for the actual manufacturing side of things. The design of experiments as well, stats goes into that. Uh, I would say... Maybe a a little bit of study of business would be helpful, just because if you're manufacturing anything at scale, you're going to be dealing with you know large sums of money and budgets and accounting. No one likes to find out that they ran out of money halfway through doing a project. So just ha- have that known. Um, and I would say understand some concepts of engineering. You don't necessarily have to be you know, full on, I'm going to major in mechanical engineering or something or industrial engineering or, you know, pr- uh, production engineering. You don't necessarily need that, but at least be familiar with some of those concepts. I have Coursera is very helpful. edX is very helpful. Also, I'd say 
if there is a community biospace in your city, like Prophase was in Austin, I would recommend going by there and just hanging out, uh, have a project idea, play around, develop things. I think that early stage sort of tinkering is a good way to judge, do you actually like the hands-on of biology? Because if you do, biomanufacturing probably is something you're going to like. Uh, so yeah. I'd say th those would be my recommendations. What would you say is the greatest or most considerable impact of biomanufacturing on the world? Uh, I would say probably making food more affordable. Uh, I would say the creation of cheese ended up making a lot of uh, making food more calorically dense probably did help early civilization quite a bit. Uh, the fermentation of alcohol, same thing, making a beverage that is potable because most water probably wasn't potable in ancient times. That helped the development of civilization. I'd say uh, in the modern day, uh, being able to produce medications for a lot... Actually, actually yes. Modern day insulin production. That's a good example. Hmm. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah, so insulin in the United States is very, very expensive. But that's because of the U.S. health system being built as it is. Uh, but the actual production cost for insulin now since 1983, we use E. coli genetically altered E. coli to produce insulin in laboratories, we can produce insulin for $10 for a vial. I mean, that, that's crazy. You know, being able to actually produce a life-saving medication for that cheap. That is what I call impressive from science. <laughs> yes, that, that I think is a much more recent example of biomanufacturing's effect on the world. That, that that seems like one that I'll stick with. What has been your biggest inspiration for the work you personally do? Or in other words, what drives you? Well, I suppose this kind of relates back to the, uh, the Stalin quote, as well as the making the absurd sci-fi universe available and affordable and scalable. Uh, being able to bring things that I wouldn't have even imagined or maybe would have only seen in like a video game or a comic book, bringing that into reality and having it be totally casual. I mean, that sounds incredible. <laughs> I mean, just being able to make the things of dreams like, oh yeah, no, nah, it sits on my counter and it makes me breakfast. Yes, gaze mm -hmm. at it. <laughs> and then the last question, Eduardo. If you had the ability to share a single message with the world, what would you say? Um, I would say, in all likelihood, you are more powerful than you give yourself credit for. You're probably better at a particular thing than you're willing to acknowledge you are. Uh, that being said, because you are more powerful than you think... Please be responsible. I love that answer. So this has been an incredibly fascinating conversation. I've learned a lot and I expect that my listeners will really enjoy this conversation and learn a lot themselves. But for those still interested in learning more about you, what it is that you do, or even getting in touch with you uh, or your company, how can they do so? Oh, uh, yeah, we have a website, uh, www.portunis.io. Uh, my email, uh, Eduardo Longoria at portunis.io. Uh, I think I do still have an Instagram, uh, L Biotech, like L, like the Spanish word for the L Biotech. I update it occasionally, but honestly, I'm not the best at social media. Also, I'm pretty sure we, we, we have a Twitter now. Portunis does have a Twitter. And I will get it to you. I think Perfect. it is Portun. I think it's at Portunus seventeen. So yes. I will. I'll make sure to grab that information from you, and I will add that to the description. 
of the podcast so people are able to get in touch with you, follow you on social media if you do post there, and to learn more about Port Tunis as well. Nonetheless, Eduardo, it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I believe that Roshan is an incre- is an incredible good company uh, with the likes of you, and you have a lot of incredibly interesting thoughts, ideas, and the work you and your company Portunus does is fascinating. And I really hope to see a lot of it come to market. So thank well, you thank again, thank you very Eduardo. much, Tasher. It's been great talking to you, and thank you very much, Rashawn, for the invite. I, I really appreciate this. Awesome. So that will do it for this episode of the All Things Interesting. Man has time. Time to think.